If your National Guard training was interrupted by cannibal mutants, what would you do? I'm gonna break down the mistakes made by the inexperienced group of soldiers, what you should do, and how to beat the family of flesh-eating freaks in The Hills Have Eyes 2. This group of LARPers is about to learn just how out of depth they are facing off against deranged mutants who know the terrain like the back of their disfigured hands. This is like Iwo Jima. If Iwo Jima was an old nuke testing site, and the Japs were low-rent families who refused to leave and slept under radiation fallout for decades, and the Marines were Walgreens employees that were relegated to some C-team goon squad in the National Guard for getting themselves killed in every training mission. As the saying goes, you don't rise to the occasion, you fall to the level of your training, which for these wannabes is really fucking low. Before we jump in, I'm looking for more clever nerds to help me beat all these apocalypses, death games, monsters, and stupid protagonists. If you're interested, click the link in the description. Alright, back to it. This sequel to The Hills Have Eyes picks up shortly after the first movie, where I covered how oppressively stupid the road tripping family was. Key word, was. Well, the remaining family members that survived called it in, and the military deployed a search and destroy team to eradicate the mutants. Assuming the area was now all clear, or just not giving a fuck, the higher ups ordered an unarmed geek squad to install electronic monitoring in the area. The brass's incompetence continues to shine as they conveniently forgot to tell the techies about the cannibals or provide them with any sort of military escort. The unsuspecting scientists are quickly murdered, dismembered, and eaten. Foster and Hans are the first victims. Let me break down the official reports and tell you how it really went down. A search and destroy team was never sent in. Instead, a few grunts were simply ordered to put up a couple of no trespassing signs on the perimeter. You think the military gives a fuck about some genetically deformed hillbillies enough to send in special ops to crawl through hundreds of caves like some Vietnam tunnel rats? There's no drug money or geopolitical power moves there. The military and mainstream media most likely slandered, gaslit, and outright right deny the family's claims of being attacked. It's not a good look to admit to the American populace that they accidentally created nuke monsters that were lurking around New Mexico eating innocent people. Then they negligently, no, negligence implies that they're smart and look the other way. It's more like uncaringly sent in some dorks to wiretap the old facility to try and monitor the mutants for some special interest pet project. I mean, why not send a military unit to escort the scientists to ensure sure that they succeed in setting up the surveillance system. There's no reason not to. There's really nothing to study either. Just start testing Stark Industries Jericho cluster missiles in the area. Tony said he'd personally guarantee the bad guys won't come out of their caves. Just good enough for me. As for the scientists, encountering anyone on the secret science base that they were not informed about should be cause for alarm. The base is in the middle of nowhere, so Joe Schmo is not accidentally wandering into it. This is a controlled area that requires a top secret clearance to be in. He realistically would be calling that in the second he saw someone. Besides the fact that the freak shouldn't be on base in the desert, the guy is covered in blood munching on a snake he's literally split in half. This person isn't alone or in distress as he's too calm. He knows these hills. It's probably a local, which is terrifying. Dr. Foster should look behind him to ensure the mutant isn't walking him off a cliff, then put his back to the rock wall to prevent someone from sneaking up on him. At the very least, with your back to the wall, you could see him coming and attempt to pick up a rock to protect yourself. Honestly though, with no weapons and no training, Dr. Foster probably got off light here. Mutant strength is no joke. Mutant smell is also no joke. That's why you need to check out Scentbird. Scentbird is a monthly and affordable fragrance subscription service that offers luxury designer brand perfumes and colognes like Prada, Burberry, and even niche brands like Skylar and Confessions of a Rebel. Start by taking the quick online quiz. Based on your preferences, Scentbird will curate scents you and everyone who asks smell you will enjoy. It's awesome because you get a 30-day supply of each scent to test out. Instead of committing to a full 
full-size bottle that costs as much as your rent. With Father's Day coming up, give him the gift of not smelling like the office. This month, I received three new vials of colognes to check out. The vials are in a case that you twist open to spray. The first one is a Luna Rasa from Prada. Notes of spearmint, orange, and ambroxa give you a spicy yet clean feel. The next one, book from Commodity, emanates warming, fresh scents of sandalwood and cedarwood. The third one is Well Played by Confessions of a Rebel. Hints of lavender and incense make it a perfect scent for a classy night out. Scentsbird is offering a great deal for you nerds. Use the link in the description or the code NERD to get 55% off your first month at Scentbird. It's just a little over $7 for your first month. Available in the USA and Canada. Thank you, Scentbird, for partnering with me on this video. We then meet our National Guard candidates who miserably fail their training exercise before being dispatched to resupply our science camp. This tier one squad of stereotypes consists of Napoleon, the smart one, Barbie, the blonde girl, Crank, the angry one, Sarge, the wise leader, Del, the hero, Missy, which is the brunette girl, Spitter, the big one, Mickey, the handsome one, and Stump, the cocky one. And these noobs are going head on with our op four is Stabber, the Mutant 1, Grabber, Mutant 2, Chameleon, Mutant 3, Hansel, the Nice Mutant, and Papa Hades, the Mutant Leader. The group finds the base that they're meant to resupply abandoned. Sarge puts everyone to work and sends Crank to investigate the bunker alone. After picking up a distress signal on the mountaintop, Sarge organizes a search and rescue mission, leaving behind the smart one and blonde girl at the camp to keep trying the radio. Who the hell approved a force-on-force -force training exercise with live fire and real grenades? Jesus Christ. I'm surprised all of our protagonists didn't die right then, but they didn't. And now, we have to follow their suicide mission. Arriving at a deserted camp like this should trigger concern. At the very least, his order said he was dropping off equipment to people working at the camp. Consequently, it was a very bad idea to send a rookie soldier alone to search a distant, isolated bunker with everyone else already missing, and then leave two other rookie soldiers alone to man the radios. One of the soldiers literally asked the Sarge if they should take live ammo or blanks. What is the point of your weapon if bullets don't come out of the barrel? I honestly think I'm going to be disappointed if everyone doesn't die. Sarge's first step should have been to try the actual camp radio that Amber tries to call out on. Then he would have realized immediately that their line of communication with the outside world both on the main radio and the hand radios was cut off. Assuming the scientists were not stranded, where are their vehicles at? More cause for concern. Now, the mountainous terrain could interfere with comms. The signal mirror does indicate that someone might have gotten hurt installing equipment on the top of the mountain, and they might have driven their vehicles to another installation site around the mountain. All reasonable. Still, load your gats and don't split your squad up unnecessarily. At most, under the condition that both units can maintain radio contact with each other, I'd have left four people at the base to man the radios and to watch for the signal mirror and signal to the soldiers if they're getting closer or farther as they started their descent, or if the scientists showed up. If we couldn't maintain comms, I would not split my squad. If my team missed a comm check interval, the rescue team would abort and head back. Oh, and I wouldn't have left Napoleon distracted in a ballerina pose instead of helping with the radio. Of course, what really would have helped is if everyone was informed of what they were dealing with ahead of time, so this whole situation could have been avoided. While the group is searching for the missing scientists, the handsome one injures his ankle and gets sent back to the camp alone. Back at base camp, a man emerges from the porthole and tries to warn them about the mutants. He's only able to mutter out an unhelpful, they're here, before dying from his infected cuts. The blonde girl thinks they should go find the rest of the troops, but the smart one thinks they should stay and continue to try the radio. With the shit man, Wilson down, that's three for the mutants. They should not have sent Mickey back alone with an injured leg when people are mysteriously missing and someone is calling for help. They should instead have one or two other soldiers help Mickey walk back down for safety. While traumatized and in shock, Wilson should have been more careful with his words. Their here doesn't help. It'd be better to say cannibal mutants attacked us so they know what the actual threat is. There was nothing that could have been done for Wilson though. He was deep in septic shock and passed within a minute. Either way, someone cut him 
them up and dunked them in the porta potty. The soldiers need to get their guns level, which should never have been left unattended in the first place. Load up with the spare ammo in the truck, set up 360 degrees of security around the truck in the radio, and make contact with the rescue team via the radio. Or if the interference is too great, fire their rifles in the air to signal the rescue team to return to base immediately and get back up. Moments later, they sniff out that their truck is engulfed in flames and both their weapons are missing. The blonde girl jogs after the rest of the team by herself and is attacked by Mutant One. Fortunately, the handsome one finds them just in time and saves the blonde one by putting a clutch round into the mutant's shoulder. Mutant One dives into a nearby tunnel and ambushes Mickey from another crawl space. Mickey gets pulled into the hole and by the crunchy, goopy noises, we can assume he's dead. Napoleon and Barbie both decide to continue their ascent through the mutant's rock maze. Mickey's death marks four kills for the mutants. And that's why you don't leave your transportation, communication, and weapons unattended. Either these mutants have Sam Fisher sneakers, or these soldiers are all deaf. Hearing loss caused by proximity gunfire is a real thing that affects over 8% of the military, given that no one was actually wearing hearing protection during the live fire training exercises. That number makes sense. I'd guess they suffered from a few too many TBIs from close range explosive blasts too. Why Napoleon, even after realizing someone is attacked attacking them, insisted on sitting by the radio with a dark tent behind him is beyond me. Ascending the mountain is also stupid. Clearly a local is after them, and thus the rocky trails provide a clear advantage for the locals over the open sightlines of the base. Mickey should never have been left alone. Napoleon and Blondie should have had their M4s on them. Blondie shouldn't have ran off alone up the mountain by herself. Really just all around horrible decision making here. As soon as Mickey got tripped, he, Blondie, or Napoleon should have been firing rounds between his toes down the hole while the other helped pull. This should get the mutant to let go. Even if he makes Swiss cheese out of his feet, it's better than getting sucked into the hole and ripped to shreds. He should have an actual tourniquet in his IFAC that he can use to stop the bleeding too. Mickey could have survived, and armed with this weapon, they should all return to base and hold out there. Meanwhile, the other troops find one of the dead bodies, which has its very sharp wallet stuffed into its head. Sarge has everyone move out, taking flanking routes around a boulder. When Crank and Spitter get isolated, they're attacked by Mutant 2, who executes some Mel Gibson Patriot guerrilla tactics. Spitter takes an axe to the back, falls down, and starts spraying full auto everywhere. When Sarge arrives, Spitter mistakes him for the mutant and mows him down. They don't even attempt to save Sarge's life, and immediately start carrying his body back down the mountain. Sarge is the fifth human death. These people are honestly their own worst enemies. Take the mutants out of the equation and they'd still find a way to get themselves killed. Finding a dead person with a wallet shoved into their fatal wound is some serial killer sh since a fall wasn't the likely cause of Foster's death, one or two soldiers can examine the body, but the rest should be turned towards the hills, guns raised in a defensive perimeter until Crank has concluded his body search. Sarge should have them in a tight circular formation, moving with their guns ready, scanning in all directions for signs of movement, especially because they're in unfamiliar terrain where they have to look down every three seconds to keep from tripping over rocks. The moment they find the body, this becomes a crime scene, so the course of action would be to make contact with the ground team, Napoleon and Barbie. Then, notify range control to send out MPs and CID to investigate. Of course, nobody established comms ahead of time, so that's out. Once they know that they're in danger, the route back to base should have the most open sightlines possible, avoiding tight corridors and areas where an attacker would have close range high ground. I wouldn't split my squad up to where we lost sight of each other like Sarge did. This didn't help them achieve anything, and left Spitter and Crank vulnerable. Spitter and everyone else should be checking their fire, not muzzle-sweeping friendlies, gun up with safeties on when not actively engaging. Once this mutant throws the first stone, they should realize he doesn't have a gun. With that information, they should also realize that they have time to regain their footing, so that they're in a stronger position to not only aim better when they shoot, but also to stop shooting if a friendly walks into the line of fire. If an attacker is circling you in a confined area like this, and with the high ground on their side, it'd be better to move out of the cab 
chasm to give yourself better visibility and more room in which to maneuver before trying to open fire again. The exit to this rock corridor is literally like 10 feet away. Crank can take point and Spitter can watch his rear while they move. Sarge was hit in the chest numerous times, even though there's probably no hope of his survival, for the trainees to not even make an attempt is ridiculous. Performing CPR on a still breathing person doesn't count and shouldn't be done. Their first step should be to remove his vest and shirt so they can identify the entry and exit of each gunshot wound. With a gunshot wound, the goal is to stop the bleeding by applying enough pressure and coverage. Exit wounds will be larger than the entrance wounds and need to be treated first. Stuff gauze into the wound to reduce bleeding and then cover the wound with plastic and tape it on all four sides. That prevents air from collapsing the lung. Getting the bleeding to stop is the priority, even over breathing. He is far more likely to die from blood loss. Keep stuffing gauze into the wound until it stops before taping it. His lung will likely collapse, so grab a thoracostomy needle, find the second intercostal space between the second and third rib, and insert the needle. This will release the air and fluid, allowing the lung negative space to be re-established, and let the lungs inflate. All of this will be in the IFAC. Unfortunately, it's likely he'll die no matter what, and that's why you identify targets before blasting them. However, once Sarge is confirmed dead, no disrespect to Sarge, but he is literally dead weight, and there is a killer chasing them. Leave the Sarge's body behind for whatever team comes to pick up the researchers' bodies, and just focus on staying alive for now. Reaching an impasse, they decide to string Spitter and Sarge together and lower them off the cliff to the ground below. Halfway down, the rope is cut by a mutant, killing the big one and further desecrating the body of the Sarge. While the troops fight amongst themselves, the mutants steal the rest of their climbing gear. The National Guardsmen cannot catch a break, though Spitter wasn't much of a loss. They just can't make a good decision. They're actively being attacked by mountain gorillas and think to perform a shoddy repel without maintaining security of their rear, the rope, or the ground where Spitter is supposed to land. There has to be another way down that doesn't leave them as vulnerable. It's worth checking first, especially since the mutants seem to traverse up and down without climbing gear. If nothing else, someone is going to notice the colonel disappear very quickly and send people to look for him. It'd be better to hang tight and wait for backup than perform form a risky maneuver like this. And not only are they repelling a single person, but two people on the same rope, one of which is the heaviest in their group. The other is a dead man, and all that weight is pulling the rope tight across the bare rock cliff edge. At least put Sarge's shirt down to reduce the rope friction a bit. Then they send Gomer Pyle off the cliff with 170 pounds of baggage over a landing zone of sharp boulders without a fucking helmet. I'm close to being Team Mutant Cannibal here. I'm gonna go ahead and just throw them a freebie. When the mutant grabbed the gear from them, it should have taken the guns too. In fact, it had a clear opportunity to strafe the entire squad since their heads were in the dirt. Taking the long way down the cliff, they find the body of the mutilated, but still living commander from the last mission. He's lost his mind, and after telling them about the mutants and their plan to breed with the women in the group, he offs himself. Redding, taking his own life, doesn't improve the squad situation one bit. So there was a better route down, if they had taken 5 minutes to look. It seems like Redding had the gun with him before the team arrived, so why didn't he kill himself before they got there? Why would the mutants have left him alive in the first place? They seem to eat people as well as kill and inseminate them. Why would Redding lure them up with a signal mirror, if that was him, like a sacrifice? Why back yourself to the edge to kill yourself, so your gun would go over with you instead of being of use to the people you're leaving behind? It makes as much sense sense as the rest in the movie. Why did the poop man stay in the porta potty and hold his breath in poop water just to dramatically try and grab someone's Johnson when they're sitting down? Why wasn't he trying to get out the whole time? These are the kind of questions I have to think about in bed facing away from my girlfriend while she thinks I'm thinking of other girls. The women are then set as bait to ambush a mutant, and the plan goes well, with them filling Mutant 1 with lead. After some celebratory high fives, the brunette one takes off from the group and is abducted by Mutant 3, wearing a rock ghillie suit for skin. This is their first mutant kill so far, but their war is far from over. This trap is insanely risky. Not only could it have failed if the mutants were constantly observing the team to see them set it up in the first place, but the mutants could have killed one of the girls if they didn't hear him coming, which they haven't been able to hear so far. Sure, the mutants may rather kidnap the girls, but we don't know that for certain. 
We even saw one try to cleave Amber's head off before, so they're not against killing females entirely. Once the strategy did work though, they should repeat the same bait trap. If mutants are not hunting together, then they could set this trap up again and again and hide the dead mutants until all the mutants had been drawn in and killed. Or they can move down the trail with women as bait ahead of them and wait for the mutants to attack and pick them off that way. They also spent like 20 bullets on one guy. Once the mutant is downed, go over and curb stomp his skull in, or use a rock. You want to make sure your targets will stay down, especially mutants that can take bullets to the chest and keep moving with ease. Missy should have taken her celebratory pace where everyone can see her. This costs her big time. Tell the guys to turn around and have Amber keep watch. Super simple stuff. It was already risky to go off alone before, but now there's confirmed super strength mutant attackers. Stick together, or at minimum, take someone with you and use the buddy system and take your fucking gun with you the remaining soldiers start chasing missy's screams to a cave entrance the cocky one decides to split from the group to free climb down by himself and go for help he chooses to down climb in the exact same spot that the mutant had cut spitter's rope this time the mutant chops his arm off and waves goodbye as he crashes into the rocks next to spitter and sarge stump's death puts our squad at 50 percent kia or mia We've pretty much confirmed that climbing and splitting up are both horrible ideas, and this hotshot thinks to combine them. It should go without saying that Stump shouldn't go off alone. He has much better chances going into the caves with an armed group of teammates than going off on his own down a cliffside with his weapon completely out of action and nobody to cover his descent. His decision to enter the mutant passageway, yell out his position, and then resume climbing was especially stupid. It just gave away his position right before he made himself vulnerable. If he had just gone down immediately and not called out, he may have been out of reach of their grasp. The rest of the soldiers start advancing through the cave in search of Missy. Barbie pops around out of her only magazine to save for herself if she's about to be captured, then promptly falls through a hole in the floor, taking Napoleon down with her. They both recover and start trying to make their way back to Delmar and Crank. Only Napoleon seems to have found his weapon. Missy's only feet away from them, but a mutant is pinning her down with a knife to her throat. She fears to make a sound and gets left behind. Napoleon and Barbie catch the rock mutant sleuthing around. His skin makes good camouflage, but one of Napoleon's bullets finds him. Unfortunately, it was just a flesh wound, and the kill shot round is sitting in Barbie's pocket. The rock mutant berserks into them. Barbie goes hard with a thumb in the eye, while Napoleon brings a stone down on his head. Again. 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 And again. And, oh, that was the last one. Chameleon is their second mutant kill. There's still three pissed off mutants left. First of all, what could possibly be the point of separating one of the bullets from your magazine? Even if she's eventually at the point of being captured and giving up, would the mutants really give her enough time to pull that bullet out, load it, and fire it? No. Keep your gun fed and level, and by keeping the weapons on semi, you can count your shots so you know how much ammo you have left. It would be stupid to get killed because you were one shot short of putting down the threat. While moving through the tunnels, they should be traveling in a rolling T formation. This allows them to have superior frontal firepower, rear security, and the ability to clear both sides of any intersection they roll up on. Dark cave water is always suspect. Gotta watch your footing, stay to the sides, and try to hold on to something, like the bracing posts or electrical wiring. Actually, that might be a bad idea. After the fall, only Napoleon picks up his rifle. Barbie doesn't even attempt to find hers. The only thing that gives them any sort of advantage here, totally neglected. Amber should also be watching their backs while Napoleon watches the front. Instead, she's looking straight alongside him, leaving their back completely exposed to an attack. Missy honestly should have just yelled out to them regardless of the knife to her throat. Keep quiet, and her fate is likely worse than death. Since they want to keep her alive for breeding, he might not kill her outright. Once having seen the mutant, Napoleon peppering the walls was a poor strategy, since Sarge only had them take one mag of ammo, and these are notoriously poor shots. They need to be waiting until they see the whites of the mutant's eyes before firing. The blind mutant too stumbles into the room, sniffing out his dead friend and the 
soldiers. They duck into a nearby room and shut the door only to be confronted by another mutant. This one doesn't seem like he wants any trouble. Just as Delmar and Crank arrive, Mutant 2 opens up with the stolen M4, hitting Delmar in his upper chest. Crank dumps his mag into the mutant, putting him down for good. The two join up with Napoleon and Barbie, then the friendly mutant leads the group to safety, which unfortunately means they have to cross through the cannibal's kitchen. It's horrifying. It looks like they even have a lost and found pile of shoes. More like an involuntary donation drive. I don't even want to think about why there's a baby stroller or kids toys in here. Delmar's wounds are more extensive than he lets on, and dies moments later. Not wanting Delmar to suffer the same desecration as Mickey, they continue dragging his body to wherever the nice mutant is taking them. Seeing a light through a nearby cave, Crank ditches his team to get out of there, while Blondie storms off solo to go for Missy. Torn between the two options, Napoleon runs after Blondie. The nice mutant, knowing Crank's rage and the boxes of dynamites that reside in that cave, flees for his life. As the mutant expected, Crank nukes himself after accidentally tugging on the rigged up detonator. Delmar and Crank biting dirt leaves only Barbie and Napoleon in the fight. With Mutant 2 dead and Hansel being a friendly mutant, that leaves Mutant 3 and Papa Hades to contend with. Without ammo, which they should have been conserving, these soldiers need to be hoarding weapons. They have their guns to use as blunt clubs and bayonet knives, but here we also see a bloody knife a crank on the wall, scissors and a meat hook, a cleaver, and then all of these hooks. Blondie has no excuse to be unarmed. Delmar was shot by a hidden enemy, and in all likelihood, couldn't have foreseen it or prevented it. I'm just surprised it took the mutants this long to use one of their firearms. Once reunited, Napoleon and or Amber should have mentioned right away, we found a friendly one, instead of waiting until after Hansel reveals himself. Realistically, if I had ammo, I would have shot the mutant as soon as I saw him. The odds of finding a friendly friendly one are extremely unlikely, so trusting them makes no sense. But since he did save our lives, I'd stick with him for now just keep my guard up. Delmar's death here might have been avoided had he just told them about it or checked for wounds after getting shot. Now he's down and holding his team up in an exposed area. I know they're in a hurry to rescue Missy, but while they are with the nice mutant Hansel, they have plenty of time for proper bullet wound treatment, at least enough to attempt to keep him together until they escaped, especially since help may be on the way at this point. There's less hostiles since they've taken a few out, and they are on their way down the mountain. Fucking with old dynamite because you think it works like the movies, and you think you're gonna flick him at him like Faraday is a surefire way to spread your body parts across the room. If Crank had spent five seconds to talk himself out of it, or looked around a bit, he would have changed his mind or found the trigger and prevented his own death. Why was he in such a rush to move them? What was he even going to use them on? How was he going to detonate them? More good questions that he probably didn't even think through himself. Now, he's resting in pieces. The explosion opens up another shaft, which they hear more of Missy's screams resonating from. They reach an old bunker with the mannequins. Mutant number three, dressed up as one of the mannequins, attacks them. Napoleon shivs him a couple times, and Barbie finishes him off with repeated bayonet strikes. The two finally find Missy and her lover. Before they can uncuff her, Papa Hades returns and starts ragdolling Missy. Blondie pops the bullet she was saving into her rifle's chamber. Unfortunately, she's a terrible shot, and non-lethally grazes his skull at point-blank range. He chokes out Blondie until Napoleon finally impales him on some rebar, and Blondie scoops out his mutant brains with her fingers. Big Papa ain't going down yet. They get him on the ground, Missy sledgehammers his nuts a few times, and Napoleon fills his mouth with a bayonet. And finally, Hades is dead. That's the last of the mutants that we know about. With Missy's survival, only three of the original nine-man squad survived. Blondie really needs to pick up an actual weapon. So far, she's just been using her fingers to little effect. Knowing that these mutants move as quietly as they do, and that this is their territory, I would be moving through this room, stabbing each mannequin as I passed, just to make sure they weren't alive. They should have noticed one of the mannequins being a totally different skin color though, or at least proactively shanked the mannequins that were lying down. Once attacked, Amber should have immediately stabbed the mutant in the back with her bayonet while he was kicking Napoleon. The next fight with Hades was also messy. This would have been the perfect time for Blondie to load her round and dome shot him before he even knew they were there. Why risk everyone's lives in a hand-to-hand -hand fight with a giant? Missy taking a sledgehammer to his testicles, while I'm sure is plenty cathartic for her, does little to actually put him down for good. She needs to be aiming at his skull with that, or at least his chest. 
With Hades and all the mutants dead, save for Hansel, the three survivors then emerge from the caves, stranded in the desert with no supplies, help, or communication for hundreds of miles. Hopefully, help is on the way. Ultimately, only Napoleon, Barbie, and Missy survived their squad mate's idiocy or the mutant's barbarism. The colonel and his men should have put some no trespassing signs up and reactivated the weapons testing site. Problem solved and lives saved. The scientists should have had military escort. Spitter shouldn't have been spraying and praying. They never should have repelled Spitter once under attack. Mickey, Missy, and Stump shouldn't have gone off alone. Dell shouldn't have shrugged off what clearly wasn't just a flesh wound. Crank shouldn't have played with dynamite, and had Barbie and Napoleon properly secured their weapons, the truck and the radio in the beginning, they wouldn't be stranded. I think with some common sense squad tactics, we'd have beaten the mutants with less folded flags. How would you have beaten the Hills Have Eyes 2? Let me know in the comments. Hit the like button to load around into Blondie's M4. Hit the subscribe button for more preventable, untimely demises. Thanks for watching, and remember, always maintain your weapons, communication, and transportation. And remember to check out Scentbird with the link in the description.